Okay, I think we can get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here this afternoon for our program, Urban Inuit Con uh, Connections to Homeland and Culture. My name is Jillian Booth, and um, I'm the curator of academic and community programs here at UVic Legacy Galleries. Um, I'm a grateful visitor on the Kwangan territories, and, um, and I was born here, and my ancestors come from England, Scotland, and Ireland. Um, I'd like to begin this afternoon's program by acknowledging with respect the Lekwungen speaking peoples on whose traditional territories the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich people who have looked after this time, this land for time immemorial and continue their relationship with this land today. It's another rainy day here in BC, in Victoria. My thoughts go to those people around BC who have been affected by the floods this past week. Uh, before we get started, there's a few housekeeping notes. Um, if you're having technical issues, you can send an email to uh, legacy at UVic or message through the chat to our wonderful co-op student, Shannon Lake, who will be managing technical support over Zoom. Um, if you would like to access captioning for this event, uh, you can click the CC button on the bottom right hand corner. Um, the program will go until about 4.30. If you have any questions for our guests, please enter them in the chat and I will read them out near the end of the discussion. So to get us started, Heidi Langell has kindly offered um, to attend the Kulik to open today's event. Heidi will probably talk about it a little bit more, but what I know is that the Kulik is the traditional oil lamp used by the Inuit, and it represents the light and warmth provided at the hearth. It has become a symbol of women's strength and care. Beautiful, Heidi, thank you. And also to get us started, Stephanie Papik has offered to begin this discussion with an agreement inspired by the Circle Way. Uh, good afternoon. I'm calling in with deep gratitude from Husekum, which translates to Place of Clay, also known as James Bay here in the Kwangan Territory. And it's deep gratitude that I have. Uh, so uh, really grateful for Mer Barry and Heidi to share space and allow me to offer something that I like to do whenever I bring humans together. It's a uh, circle way and uh, I, I love that it resonates so much with what I've learned about my own Inuit culture and uh, some of the agreements that I'd like to offer is um, is a way for us to, how do we want to show up and support each other in this space today? Uh, I find sometimes folks on their uh, path of allyship will, you know, want to call somebody out that someone's being a racist. And the neuroscience shows that we, when we give feedback in a way that's uh, threatening, it activates our amygdala. So it puts us in our um, flight, fight, freeze, or fawn mode. Versus when we do it in a strength-based way, uh, it activates our prefrontal cortex, puts us in our planning, thinking, compassionate brain. And, and with that power of repetition, of offering a little bit of time of, of how to create this space, uh, it creates new neural pathways, new habits, new tendencies. And I really also love how that aligns with my understanding and learning about my Inuit culture is uh, a way of addressing conflict when we all have breakfast in the morning. A leader would, um, rather than call someone out, they'd be a, a reminder, a calling in for all of us. And I just love how much that um, resonates with Circle Way and and uh, and grateful that even though these ways of being had been intentionally uh, interrupted within my life that I've been able to reclaim them. So uh, one of these things I like to do is to co-create this space. And I just like to offer, um, uh, we'd like, if you'd like to offer an agreement for our time today, I'm going to move us to Menti. So if you have a phone nearby and just go to menti.com, it's an invitation to uh, type in your own agreement for our time together. And you'll start to see a word cloud appear. And then if there's any agreements that really resonate with you, uh, you can enter it again and then we'll do that kind of word cloud thing. And so one of the agreements uh, I'd like to offer is, um, 
invitation to take what you need and offer what you can. And that's one of my favorite ones because it allows, uh, it takes any hierarchy that exists puts it on its side and recognizes shared leadership. So a leader in every chair. Another one that I really appreciate is silence and shifting from that kind of dominant narrative that um, silence can be awkward to silence can be a really powerful tool. It can be a way to uh, show respect for each other. It can be a, a tool to ground ourselves, to refocus, recenter. And uh, yeah, so I'll just invite in that uh, silence. And then um, another one I also just like to really offer is just to acknowledge that each of us come into our own lineages. So, and we all have our kind of, um, yeah, that lineage and, and that we come with. And so I like to share that in terms of some of those pieces around colonization. So it's not, you know, about blame or shame. It's uh, it's just all about learning and inviting in different worldviews. So I see some folks are participating and offering some agreements for our time together, how we want to show up for ourselves or each other. So come to learn, not confirm. I love that. Thank you. To be humble, so important. And I love um, that they kind of shifted cultural competency to cultural safety and humility. Humility is such a key piece in this work. Being respectful, connection, bringing our ancestors with us, yes, inviting them into this space with us, so, so powerful. Being fully present, which is always a challenge, especially online, so definitely invite that in. Um, creating conversation, respect, listening, I love that there's three times there and what I hear lots of elders say, you know, we've got two ears and one mouth so we can listen twice as much as we speak. Honor our histories, so important, wonderful. And dialogue, nice. Ah, so I wonder how these, are these folks, are these resonating with folks? Maybe a little thumbs up or a little emoticon there in the pieces. Awesome. So one of the things I like to do just in terms of, of grounding ourselves into these agreements is to, to actually like physically do that. And I don't know if you have been uh, sitting in your chair a lot since the pandemic. I have been. So one of the things I'll invite you if you want, you can stand up, get out of your chair, maybe. Really, it's important to listen to your body more than me. And maybe just if there's like a window, you can look outside and you can first stretch your eyeballs, have a little distance view and maybe shake out an arm, shake out another arm, shake out a leg, your other leg. Maybe wave your hands in the air and jump around a little, get that blood flowing, but it'll feel a little silly. Shake it out and coming into stillness. And you could go on your tippy toes if you like, then onto your heels, then finding that middle ground, feeling the energy from Mother Earth coming up through your feet, through your hip bones, tilting your hip back, rolling your shoulders, imagining a thread, pulling your head tall, just bringing awareness to your breath, noticing your inhale and your exhale. Maybe we can take one nice big belly breath together in through our nose and exhaling through our mouth. Another nice big belly breath and exhale. And may all this time together be uh, intentional. Thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Thanks so much for participating everyone. I'm super grateful. Wow. Thank you, Stephanie, so much. And uh, Heidi. Um, wow, how how we come together and how we come to these spaces is is so important and informs what we say and what we do. So thank you for helping us all to um, ground in ourselves and ground together and ground with our ancestors. Around with this land, I looked out the window, and what I love about this time of year is that the 
leaves have fallen off the trees and you can see who's been living in the trees. There's a nest right outside my window that I didn't know was there. And of course there would have been birds there and birth there. And so thank you, Stephanie, for that. Um, and definitely needed after that long day, long, long day of classes, someone says um, in the chat. So yeah, a stretch and uh, just feeling who we all are here together. So thank you for that. Um, okay, so our program today has been inspired by the exhibition in Gasatuck, something that is far away. It's currently on at the Legacy Gallery downtown until December 23rd. And it's a beautiful collection of contemporary photographs by Barry Pottle presented with sculptures, drawings, um, and prints by Inuit artists collected from the Legacy Gallery collection. We're very excited to be celebrating Barry's work, his exploration of Ngasatuk, and how some urban Inuit connect to their homeland and culture, which can seem far away, but isn't always so. I'm very honored um, and have a lot of humility to be welcoming our fabulous guests today who are joining us from Ottawa and Victoria. So I'll just do a quick introductions. Um, these people have amazing backgrounds. I'll share some of that and then they'll get a chance to, they'll be sharing more of themselves, of course. So Barry Pottle is an Inuk artist, originally from Nunat Siavit in Labrador now living in Ottawa, Ontario. He has worked with the Indigenous arts community for many years, particularly in the city of Ottawa. Barry has always been interested in photography as a medium of artistic expression and as a way of exploring the world around him. Living in Ottawa, which has the largest urban population of Inuit outside of North of the North, Barry has been able to stay connected to the greater Inuit community. Through the camera lens, Barry showcases the uniqueness of this community whether it is a cultural gathering, family outings, or the solitude of nature that photography allows, captures the essence of Inuit life in Ottawa. Very much looking forward to hearing more about your practice, Barry. So Heidi Langell is an urban Inuk with family roots in Nunat Siavut. Uh, I practiced that before and I'm still working on it. <laughs> so, um, which is in Northern Labrador. Um, so same place as Barry's from. Um, as far as I understand. And she's one of the founders of the Ottawa Inui Children's Center, now call, called Inukatiyit, which empowers Inuit families in Ottawa with many programs and services. Heidi is, was nominated as one of the National Aboriginal Role Models in 2010-11, which enabled her to motivate and inspire Aboriginal youth across Canada. One of the many things that Heidi enjoys is providing interactive presentations to all walks of life about Inuit culture, including throat singing. Amazing, Heidi's a throat singer. Um, she actually sang a little bit before we were here. It wasn't throat singing, but um, before everybody came in, it's lovely. Um, so including throat singing history, current events, drumming, and Inuit games. She spends much of her time volunteering on various boards, including the Ottawa Police Services Community Equity Council and the Ontario Aboriginal Housing Support Services Proposal Review Committee. Whew, that's a long one. Um, I'm sure those committees do good work and they're, happy, they're lucky to have Heidi. Along with her husband, Heidi is a foster parent to Inuit children and is currently raising four children. She is motivated by changing the way of doing things to ensure better outcomes for all. Um, and those are Heidi's lovely hands we see tending the kulik. And our third guest, Stephanie Papik, is the Director for Strategic Integration of Indigenous Knowledge, Cultural Safety and Humility with the Province of British Columbia. I think it's very hopeful that we have um, something that's called uh, Strategic Integration of Indigenous Knowledge, Cultural Safety and Humility. So thank you for doing that good work, Stephanie. Stephanie's a public servant, social entrepreneur, artist, and parent of Inuit and uh, urban, sorry, European ancestry. She was born in Akechon territory, Northwest territories, and grew up in Lekwungen territory. At the age of 24, Stephanie moved to Yellowknife to learn more about her culture and strengthen family relations. She returned to Vancouver Island and for 15 years worked in provincial government, including six years 
as lead for the Indigenous Youth Internship Program, which won the Public Sector BC Workplace Inclusion Award for Diverse and Inclusive Culture Champion. In 2017, Stephanie was appointed to the Priorities and Accountability Office in the Office of the Premier of BC. She then moved on and has been with Emergency Management BC since 2018 as the Director of Strategic Integration of Indigenous Knowledge, Cultural Safety and Humility. So with those fabulous credentials <laughs> and, um, and life experience, um, we're very much looking forward to hearing your stories and, and conversations. So thank you so much for being here, everyone. Barry, did you wanna to start today? I can, thank you. Unukut, good evening. Uh, my name is Barry, Barry Vunga. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending this uh, session. And I'd like to thank uh, Jillian and Shannon and AB and Caroline and Dr. Walsh for uh, helping me put this together to uh, supporting me to get this project uh, on the go. Uh, very, very pleased and very excited to be here. And I'm so grateful to be able to have a show out in uh, Victoria. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I am coming from the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Gonquin and Anishinaabeg people. Uh, as an Inuk, I'm only a visitor here and I thank them for allowing me to be on their territory. It's a beautiful territory. I've been here for over three decades now and I actually love this territory so I thank them. Uh, where to start? Ungasi um, took is a project uh, coming out of a out of an image I did a long time ago while I was up in in, in Whitehorse. Uh, I was uh, I was attending uh, part of my job uh, way back when as a public servant, it was uh, to uh, support the independent assessment processes, uh, claim it to one under that, one under that, uh, that uh, program with respect to the uh, residential school settlement agreement. And the TRC had a national event up in Inuvik. And so uh, because there was no uh, uh, hotels uh, uh, anymore, we decided to drive up uh, the Dempster Highway, myself and my colleagues. So uh, we did that. We helped out with the, uh, supported the TRC's national event in Inuvik. And when we came back, we uh, ended up staying in a, uh, a RV center in, uh, in Whitehorse. And I was out taking pictures as I do. I just randomly go and take pictures of everything, uh, everything I see. And uh, I was taking pictures of this uh, in this park and they had a Jeep, uh, American Jeep and the window was broken. So if you see the image, Unga, uh, sorry, oh, I forgot, I lost my thought. <laughs> Un Ungava, sorry, <laughs> lost my thought for a second. Ungava, uh, that is, is the emphasis for this project. Um, uh, Ungava. I always known Ungava to be uh, so far away, but that wasn't really right in terms of what I was trying to to uh, uh, convey in this project. So I consulted with my my good friend Takalik Partridge, who's a who's a spoken word artist and the director of, of Nordic Lab here, and we were talking about it. And she says, "Well, you should try uh, uh, Ungasituk, which is something that is far away." So this is where that comes from, and 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 putting it in context and putting it in the in the context of art and myself trying to get out there in a world of art and and, and, exp and explore what can and cannot be done with with my photography uh i was able to uh develop this project under under the guise of those uh those uh those uh concepts i've been doing art uh photography for uh exhibition wise for just over 10 years now uh, started here in Ottawa with a show called uh, Decolonize Me. I, I did uh, a series of works called Awareness Series, and they were uh, uh, looking at the uh, Eskimo identification tags. If you see the images behind me, uh, that was the emphasis for that show, Awareness. So I took, uh, I took uh, the idea and, and went with it in terms of trying to develop a, a photography project based on the Eskimo identification numbers or disk numbers or tag numbers, uh, whatever you uh, want to call them these days. Uh, but in reality, I didn't, I didn't uh, plan on becoming a, an artist or a photographer. I'm not a trained uh, a photographer. I'm not a trained artist. I'm all self-taught. Uh, although I have a lot of experience in the art world, both in the uh, Inuit art and Indigenous art and Canadian art and world art overall, 
uh, I was not planning on becoming an artist whatsoever. Uh, it happened by by chance. Uh, if you remember Club Z points, <laughs> anybody remember remember Club Z? Well, I had two million Club Z points, so so I had to get rid of them before Zeller's closed, and and so we got a ghetto blaster, and and I managed to get a thirty five mil camera, a really nice uh, film camera. So that's where it really started, uh, and I I knew uh, from past experience that that photography wasn't a big uh, uh, genre with Inuit art. So I, I took that premise and I started to develop what I called contemporary urban Inuit art photography. I just made that name up myself because I didn't know what else to call it at the time. So because I live in I live in an urban setting, I I I I, I focus on urban urban Inuit because I here I am here in in Ottawa. Uh, I haven't been home in my uh, home communities since a very long time. And that's why I always say originally too. I'm always originally from from the Nazi boot. Uh, my hometown is Riglet. Uh, I, my first memories of life is from Riglet. So I always say I'm originally from Riglet. So uh, number one is I haven't lived there, so I want to pay respect to my community because I haven't lived there in a very long time or in the territory. Uh, so um, I'd like to like to uh, just respect that and and try and to honor that 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 those uh, thoughts and those. Uh, instances yeah like i said i did fall into I, i'm not a trained photographer uh i started looking at art uh and photography as a way of exploration and then i wanted to really i started out in photojournalism to be honest with you starting out photojournalism taking pictures of events uh things going on around ottawa then i would share them with the community members or if an organization was interested in looking at them i would i would send them along that way so this is really really started looking and, and, and going from photojournalism into what i call a fine art practice I wanted to look at uh, how I can develop a fine art practice using photography and using the theme of urban Inuit in my work. So I started looking at uh, 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 that way of, of creating art. And uh, from there, it just snowballed. I mean, I just uh, been doing this for 10 years. Uh, I've taken lots and lots and lots of pictures over 10 years. So I really don't have to take any pictures for a long time, uh, to be honest with you, right? So I use what I have in terms of creating projects. And this this Ungasitik was, was uh, stemming from that based on the Ungava image, right? So that's where the, this project comes to, to, come to fruition and uh, and uh, we, yeah, I really started exploring the world around me using using uh, uh, the camera photography. Uh, first, starting like I said, taking Im taking works uh, uh, and images of of events and things happening around town, whether it's on Parliament Hill, uh, trying to support the seal hunt, or whether it's uh, uh, taking pictures and interacting mm -hmm. with the World Suicide Prevention Day, or whether it's uh, at the Christmas parties or or the spring equinox, or just uh, out and about town this is where i really started looking at things and trying to develop uh, ideas based on on my surroundings here in ottawa and based on the urban inuit population here uh i i, I want to give credence to the urban inuit because uh, we are here, we are 30% of the population living in Southern Canada, whether it's in urban centers or rural uh, uh, places, we are 30% of the population living outside of the north. So that is a big population. And there are people uh, Inuit who, uh, who have never been up north, who were adopted out or who were born here, uh, uh, or whatever the case may be, who never been up north. And, and they're trying to connect with their cultures, just like me. I didn't grow up traditionally. Uh, grow, I grew up uh, 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 what we call, I guess, mixed mixed society, I guess, for lack of a better word. I didn't grow up traditionally. My parents left uh, Riglet in 1967, uh, moved to Goose Bay. So I spent a lot of my time in Happy Valley Goose Bay and spent five years in the dorm, what you call residential schools uh, out here. We call them dormitories back home. And a lot of my time was spent in Happy Valley Goose Bay. And on times I would go back to my community, whether it's in the summer or winter, whether it's uh, on holidays or, or helping out with the, with the fishing and that sort of stuff and other, other activities. So, but you know, uh, there is a huge population of urban Inuit uh, right across right across the country. So I wanna pay respect to that. I wanna give credence to that. I think it's important. We are here, we have a lot of value. Uh, we have a lot uh, to offer. We have a lot of uh, things going on, uh, good, bad, and ugly, of course. It's not always good. Uh, it's not always good. Uh, it's not always bad either. And uh, I've been trying to trying to explore some themes that are, are that pertain to mental health, suicide, and that sort of things too as well. If, 
moving uh, uh, moving forward with my with respect to my art. But I want to give credence and respect to pay respect to Inuit in in urban settings. I think it's important. Uh, when I started this practice, or, or the concept of herb and Inuit was relatively new. If you compare and contrast it with First Nations and Métis. Uh, Ottawa uh, has been home to Arab and Inuit for a very long time, probably uh, 30, 40 years, or even before that, even Heidi's dad came down to Ottawa in the uh, early, late 60s, early 70s to work. So there's been Inuit moving in and out of Ottawa for many, many years, and for various reasons, whether it's for, for work, for school, uh, move with a spouse, uh, or just to get away from the cold. I mean, it's cold up north. <laughs> I've heard people say, you want to get away, it's too cold. <laughs> Manu Ottawa is cold too, right? So, <laughs> but I wanted I, my 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 practice is 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 exploring and looking at Inuit art and trying to build concepts and art projects around that, right? So I've done the awareness series as you saw, as well as I did uh, I did a project called Foodland Security, which is a uh, access to country food in an urban setting by Inuit. So there's a there's a uh, a project with 15 images that speaks to country food, the meaning of the meanings behind country food, and why Inuit love it so much, and 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 the uh, the challenges of of acquiring country food in an urban setting. So, as well as other things, I contribute to uh, lots of different projects uh, in in town here. I I, I uh, I'm recent, I'm looking at a new project now that's looking at my my own personal life, uh, uh, and uh, especially. The last two years has been very challenging with COVID, as we know, right? So it's been very challenging, and that gives its uh, its its its, its uh, challenges and boundaries when you want to go out and, and be in a community. I, I think I spent two years, like everybody else, sitting in, in my computer, <laughs> be being a computer in I think, for lack of a better word, right? <laughs> Because <laughs> we can't get out. I mean, last week we had uh, we had the uh, park naming uh, for the late uh, great Annie Putagut here in town, and I think that was my first uh, time being out in a, a social setting in two years. So that was kind of weird and, and challenging because you go, oh no, it's COVID, <laughs> right? So, but anyways, uh, so but you know, it does have its challenges uh, in terms of trying to maintain contacts and, and and working on projects and going out and 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 trying to to get in the uh, bigger world within my community here in Ottawa. But if you look at some of the images, I don't know when you want to show some images of the work there, Shannon. I don't know. It's up to you when you're ready. Uh, we can look at some of them. It'll give you a little more explanation. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Can you tell everybody about your tie, Barry? It's so beautiful. Well, my tie, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your nice comments. I got that from Ellison, Newfoundland uh, a couple of years ago. We were down for... Uh, for a show in Bonavista, they do have a biannual. Uh, they've started in 2017, and they just finished one this year. And uh, lucky enough, and really exciting enough, that they had uh, I think six artists from New Nazi Wood in the show as well. So, so that was fun. So it comes from Ellison. It's from the uh, the uh, ceiling monument, the ceiling uh, museum there. So they pay uh, homage and, and respect to the the ceiling industry. This show, this image here. It's called Iglak. Iglak is basically a window. Uh, I took this image uh, a few years ago. I want to get my notes here. I want to get the right date here for. for uh, I took it while I was uh, at Winterlude. Winterlude is a winter festival here in Ottawa. They do every year at the, at the end of January and uh, and. Uh, uh, February. So I was standing in lineup waiting to look at the, the ice sculptures and I was sitting there and this gentleman here was starting to do some work on a sculpture and I, I really liked it. And it brought me back to uh, a time when I was reading some some uh, uh, research on uh, uh, individuals going up in the Arctic and doing actual research on Inuit. And a lot of the conversation and research was involved in inside the igloo. So he was doing his work. The researcher was doing his work and looking at the Inuit uh, and the, their life inside the igloo. So I was thinking about that, and this it brought me back to that uh, that uh, those uh, those uh, readings and this image brought me back to that very thing. And I was there looking at this, looking at the gentleman there and I took this picture and it came out. I really liked the uh, the gloves and the yellow, right? The yellow coat he had on. But it brought me back to to the idea of, of 
of uh, researchers studying Inuit from within. And I want to take that concept of me as an Inuk living here in Ottawa in a lineup, looking at uh, Hablinat white people and doing their own thing. So researching and, and looking at that from that perspective, from that lens, right? So that's where that comes from. It's called Iglak uh, Window. Next, please. And this is the Ungava, Ungava piece. I took this, as I mentioned, up in, up in uh, Whitehorse, but it reminded me, the glass reminded me, uh, the broken glass from, Amer this is from American Jeep. Uh, it, it reminded me of the coast of Ungava Bay. That's really, really comes from. And so uh, that coupled with the Americans and, and, and on the uh, information card, they talked about the the do line, the distant early warning uh, system they developed uh, back in the Cold War, where the uh, the Americans and Canadian government developed a do line warning system right across the it's a radars uh, to detect to detect uh, bombs from the Soviet Union. So uh, so they talked about that as well in the in the uh, in the in the uh, write up on this. Uh, the Americans experience in in in, uh, in Whitehorse in Alaska, but also in in the west of our west of the rest of the Arctic, including Nunavik as well. And Ungava is in in uh, the up way up in in in, uh, in Nunavik on the coast, of, way up northern coast, of, northeast of or northwest of of uh, Nunavik. So so that's where that comes from. That image there. Next, please. This one here I called uh, keel out uh, as ice or siku as ice. So it's a drum as ice. I love ice. I've done a lot of work on ice. As we know, uh, climate change and global warming is, is having a drastic effect on, on ice and snow and everything up in the north. So so I've been, I've been taking pictures of ice uh, here in Ottawa and the surrounding areas for the last couple of years and developing works that speak to uh, to climate change and and the urban voice within that uh, realm of uh, of interest and as a as a as a topic of, of concern and discussion but if you look at it it looks like a drum if you look at it it looks like I'll show you my drum I have a drum here this is my, my drum that was made by David Sirkwak. Uh wonderful leader here in town, uh, elder. If you look at it, it looks like a drum, right? So it, it, I took that and I go, oh, look at that, it looks like a drum, right? But the idea idea was to, cause I love ice uh, and uh, I have a, a dear friend of mine who passed away uh, a number of years ago is Ruby. She loved ice too. And we, we were talking one day about ice and the bubbles that are formed in, in ice. And we both loved it, right? So so I, I look at that and I, I remember doing uh, having that conversation and and, and uh, having those memories and and while I'm out on the boat exploring and taking pictures of ice I just I, I keep that in mind but I wanted to show the idea of climate change and, and the, given that the the urban voice and the urban perspective if that's such a thing using photography this one here was uh, taken on a lake called Clear Lake which is about uh, 45 minutes to an hour hour and a half from Ottawa uh this uh heron the my friends call him dracula and he came as a, he came he used to come about uh, every day he'd come about around around our dock and that and he would sit on our dock even with us there and he wouldn't really be uh, bothered with us so one day i had looked at him and i goes i'm going to follow him i want to see what he's doing i want to see how he hunts and to see if i can actually capture him hunting and so that's what that is i spent uh, four or five hours just following him, observing him, and uh, try to try to take the best photographs that I can of him in action. So he's a predator, if you see that, uh, right? So I, I managed to get some nice shots of that. It took a long time, but it, it's it's my way of exploring the world around me and trying to find something that's different or unique that could speak to my photography and try to help develop my own practice, right? So, so that's what that's about. And I also, I think I put in brackets, Billy, did it hurt or does it hurt, right? So it's like, it must hurt, right? <laughs> Just my own weird sense of humor, right? So, but, you know, it's a way of, of exploring things around you. And also to try and push the boundaries of of what uh, Inuit art is. I mean, you know, although this is a scene of a bird and it's, it's prey, it, it re it's an observation in hunting practices, in skills in observation, 
in, in, in observing uh, the world around you, observing the wildlife around you, how do they hunt, uh, what do they do, and uh, what does it mean to me as an artist, what can I capture, what can I capture, and what can I say about it, right? So, so that's what that speaks to. In, in a, and then what, what does contemporary urban Inuit art photography look like, right? Next, please. This one is called Cultural Ties. Uh, it's part of a series I did on the comic. The, the comic is, is the uh, sled that uh, we use, a uh, dog, dog sled. Uh, to me, it's a very important. I, I find that the comic has, has been sorely undervalued as a, as a tool for Inuit in terms of travel and survival and, 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 and getting around uh, the land and the territory. So I did a series of, of photographs on the comic and I, I just put it in, 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 uh, in, uh, I tried to do it in a light, light hearted, light hearted way in terms of a car, a vehicle, like, uh, like I wanted to, I titled some of these things like a uh, shotgun, uh, called shotgun. So if you're on a comic, uh, if you think if you're in a car, think of the same thing as you're on a comic, right? So, so just putting some fun and, 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 and some, uh, humor with, within the art itself or an attempt at that, but it stems back to the cultural aspect to some of the things I, I remember growing up and, and being uh, participating in from from my own culture like I said I didn't grow up traditionally uh, per se but I do have some knowledge and living in Ottawa has allowed me to gain more more knowledge on my on my culture and my my my, my life uh, uh, back home and as well as here in Ottawa this one I called out of La Paz it was a uh, up it's outside of Pembroke Ontario which is about two hours from here it's a community uh, called La Paz, and we were driving around. Uh, we were on vacation, actually, family vacation, and my wife and I were driving around, and uh, it was uh, dusk. Is it dusk? Nighttime? Dusk or yeah, dust, right? <laughs> so we were driving back home and I happened to see the the, uh, the skyline and these trees. And I actually took a picture from from the car and hoping that it would would uh, would work and and come out and uh, it did so i called it out of the past but it speaks to the travels that i go around about uh, and 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 we are uh, engaged here in ottawa and the surrounding areas we go anywhere from up to two hours three hours traveling around my wife and i and and my family at times so we go around and travel around and look and explore the the, uh, the uh, land that we're on and uh so it's a it's a it's a this one was a a exercise in technology and technical aspects and to see if I could actually challenge myself to see if it would, it would come out at, at low light. Most of my works at low light, I don't do a lot of whole light, low light it lighting images. It's just too hard. Uh, I find it too difficult. As I say the same thing as portraits too. I don't do a lot of studio portraits because it's, it's challenging and I just don't have the experience or the knowledge or the equipment to do it. But it, this one speaks to the travels uh, that I uh, that we uh, engage in uh, here at the Ottawa uh, Valley, and just trying to put that 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 context uh, from an artistic perspective and artistic uh, uh, vice, I guess, for lack of a better word. So you know, my my, my sorry, it's Michael, Mike. Coming to Sorry, what was that? Oh. But anyways, uh, so that's just a little bit about my practice. Uh, but like I said, I've been doing it now. I've been exhib exhibiting my work for 10 years. Uh, practice, just probably 12 to 13, 14 years, somewhere around there. Uh, professionally, the, the last 10 years. Uh, and my work, as I say, focuses on urban Inuit uh, realities and life here in Ottawa and elsewhere. I do have images from up north too, but uh, it's not my focus right now. Uh, I do have a lot of images I have taken while I was in my travels up north, but it's not my my uh, my uh, interest right now because I am here in an urban setting and I like to focus on urban Inuit. So I think that's it for now. Great, very beautiful photos. Um, no, and it's a beautiful you. way to connect with the world around you. I was, I'm struck by um, how much of your the content that you showed us is the natural world and outdoors, even though you live in an urban space. And I'm curious to know whether that 
the fact that you go outside to take your photographs, if that is part of your connecting to your culture, to your homeland, just a thought. Yes, yes I agree to a certain extent. Yes, if you look at the the uh, the uh, bird image, the heron, that that really speaks to some of the things I've learned growing up uh, from my culture, from my knowledge, and from my family's uh, 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 teachings and and that sort of stuff. Going out on the land, I've always gone out on. Uh, I always go out on land. Doesn't matter where I'm to. I just go. I just leave everybody. Everybody gets mad at me. I just leave people and go away. Right. So <laughs> my wife doesn't like it in one bit. But but that's the way I do. I just go out and explore the world around me. I I find it uh, uh, interesting. I find it very challenging. Uh, it's hard to maintain a, a, a practice for sure. Uh, uh, at times, uh, because everything doesn't really uh, 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 speak to a project or whatever. But you know, I I go out and and, and explore the world around me. I take pictures of everything. To be honest with you, I take pictures of everything. My 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 the, my uh, my motto is practice, practice, practice. I go out and practice all the time. So uh, even if I'm just in my backyard here or just uh, out out in the boat, uh, my neighborhood, I'll take my camera and just go out and practice, practice. I may not take everything. I uh, may not mean it. it. Images may not mean anything at the time, but it depends on really what I I I I, I am doing and and after the fact as well. When I look at my images, some ideas will come after the fact as well, right? So, but yeah, I do go. Out, I do a lot of my work outside. Well, it's pretty clear that all of that practice has been fruitful, Barry. Thank you so much for sharing, for sharing, and for all, any of you who haven't been to the exhibition, um, the photographs that we have here at Legacy are beautiful as well. Um, Lolly, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Heidi, did you want to chime in and share some of your thoughts and experiences? <laughs> um. Barry Nakamik, that was awesome. And it's nice, like I've seen your photos for years, right? It's nice to hear some of the stories behind them. Um, the Inuit community in Ottawa is large, but it's also small in a way um, because because it's Inuit community. <laughs> like there's, it's not six degrees of separation, it's two, <laughs> two degrees of separation. But anyway, a funny one of the funny stories about Barry is um, there's two berry bottles. Um, you know, we, we we tend to name our children traditionally after other other folks, right? So, uh, at last count, there was 24 people named after my dad um, who passed away 21 years ago. So, there's two berry bottles. Not uncommon. Um, both of them at one time were working for the federal government, so you couldn't even say the ITK berry bottle and the federal government berry bottle because they were both at you know. But we always knew which Barry Pottle it was as if at community events as if he had his camera with him. <laughs> he always I'm like, there's Barry Pottle, which one? The one with the camera, right? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> Barry, yeah, Barry has been a part of the Ottawa Inuit community for, for so long. Um, and it's absolutely amazing the, the work that he has done. And um, I, I tend to take pictures too, not nearly as many as, as, as Barry. Um, I am a, a lifelong urban Inuk, meaning I was born in the South. I'm the youngest of seven um, and the only one born in the South um, and always raised in the South. I, I've been fortunate in my life to have traveled to the North, um, but I've never lived there. So, um, so it's different. Like we're, we're, getting, we're getting to the point where there's a lot of people who have been born in the South, but still identify as Inuit. Um, we've gone through a, a large cultural shift in such a short period of time. I got involved in the Inuit community in Ottawa when I became a parent, and I became a parent quite young. Um, I was in Nova Scotia, and I was going to college, and I became friends with the only other Inuk person that I could find, um, and her and I were friends, and uh, she had two kids. She was older than I was, and she had two kids. I was 20. She said to me one time, you know, if anything happens to me, will, will you take care of my kids? And I was 20 and I was like, nothing's going to happen to you. You're fine. Right. But of course, of course, I'll take care of your kids, but nothing's going to happen to you. Um, little did I know, and I, I see the signs now, um, but I didn't see them at the time. Um, but less than a month later, she had committed suicide. 
so which is so common amongst Inuit um, and it's something that we are working on changing um, but every Inuk person I know has been touched by suicide in, in some way shape or form um, and children children talk about suicide quite a bit um, because they've had it in their family they've experienced it so it's it's not kind of hidden or secret or anything like that anyway so that's uh that's when i became a parent i was 20 years old and um these two beautiful kids their mom had just committed suicide so i did not want them to go through being the only inuk in school the only inuit kids in class or in school the way i did um because my early elementary school high school our family was the only Inuit family that I knew of. Um, and I had a great childhood. It was fantastic, played hockey, you know, delivered newspapers and all of the rest of it. But it was difficult in school sometimes being the only Inuit. And I did not want that for these two beautiful kids um, on top of their mom committed suicide, right? Like I didn't, I didn't want that. So then I started working, um, I started working to fix that, um, but we didn't, we didn't stay in Nova Scotia long. We, we came to Ottawa because I knew that there would be supports in Ottawa. Um, so we came to Ottawa and I was working at a place called Thingness of Inuit, Inuit, a place where Inuit are welcome, and became a member of the Parent Council, um, which later formed the board for the Ottawa Inuit Children's Centre. Um, so Ottawa has Ottawa is blessed, um, like berries, right? There's the, the good, the bad, the ugly, but there's a community here. And um, like him, I have learned a lot about my culture from the Inuit in the Ottawa Inuit community. And it's absolutely fantastic. Like I learned to throat sing in my 20s um, from another, from my best friend, <coughs> excuse me, who's from Pangner Tongue. So seeing, seeing Barry's photographs, hearing the stories, it's absolutely fantastic because um, I know Barry in a different light, right? I know him in the community. Like, we used to play baseball together in the 90s. So <laughs> that's, um, I know him in a different way. I, did, uh, I do have some photographs too. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I was, I was going to just, I have three photographs to share just to kind of build on what Barry has already shared. Ah, oh, there we go. Now I can, now I can share them. <clears throat> All right. Um, so Barry talked about the country food and, um, my dad, when I was younger, my dad would, would travel up North and he would come back and he would come back with caribou and he would come back with goose and, I never really liked fish <laughs> until I became an adult, um, and then I learned uh, I, I know it was always uh, more exposure, right? Uh, it was always in the Inuit community, and uh, and then when I was traveling up north, of course, I didn't want to, um, uh, when I was being hosted by people and they were offering fish. Hang on a second. <clears throat> I don't know why my throat is is whatever, doing what it's doing right now, but there you go. Um, so this was Thanksgiving a few years back, um, had, uh, I had some family over and we had the turkey and everything else, but we also had Arctic char. Um, so I took that photo because raising foster children, Inuit foster children, getting country food, it's always a challenge, but it's so very important. Um, I did eat a lot of caribou as a kid and it's one of my favorites. I don't know, there's a notice popping up saying, please move this window away. Are you guys able to see the, the picture of the fish? You are. Okay, then I'm going to ignore that little note saying, please move this window away. Um, another way that we stay connected with culture, um, this, is, this is one of my kids and I, um, this is actually a selfie. I took the cell phone and, and, and I took this as a selfie. Um, Inuk Katagid is asked to use this in some of their flyers and they said, we want to give credit to the photographer who took the picture. And I'm like, yeah, I did. <laughs> like, it's the best selfie I've ever taken. Um, but yeah, with our, with our parkas. And, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, 
dark because they do keep us warm in, in Ottawa when it's cold and wet and freezing rain and snow and the whole mix. Um, I remember walking in downtown Ottawa with my this this son here. I have a lot of sons, um, but this son here was three years old and he was wearing a parka with fur around the hood. And we were crossing the street at that Rideau Center. And, and for those of you who know Ottawa, Rideau Center is, is it's a pretty busy place. And this woman, as we were crossing the street, starts yelling at my three-year-old because he's wearing fur. And I was, and, and she's yelling at him. <laughs> like she's down in his face, like yelling at him. He didn't know what, he was three. He didn't, oh, it was just so bad. Um, but, you know, and, and that's a, a lot of uh, Inuit, have to do a lot of advocating around fur and fur products and sustainable hunt and and all the rest of it. Um, and I try to use humor as much as I possibly can when I'm educating people about the use of fur um, and why it's important and how is it sustainable and why it's sustainable and all the rest of it. Um, there's a there's a very famous Inuit um, documentary called angry you know that talks about the seal the seal trade um but it's it's not just the seals the seal the seal economy is very very important but it's other furs as well um so always always grateful for for the parkas that i have and and my kids have in order to stay warm and then this last picture here also goes back to food because food is just awesome um, this was actually taken in Ottawa uh, in February on a day that we celebrate called Inuit Day. It's not an official thing. It's not on the calendar. It's uh, it's something that Inukatikit was doing pre-COVID and able to get country food from hunters and trappers associations in the north. Um, so these three beautiful girls, they are urban Inuit like I am but they are growing up loving the culture, loving the seal, loving the food, um, and learning about it at, at a young age at a, at a center that's been uh, created for them. So I, I love this picture as well because um, it just, it was so different from my childhood where, I you know, if, if my dad brought a seal back, whoo, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't show any of my friends. And, and then we've got these three young girls who are super excited to, to see the seal and what happens at Inuit Day is then the elders come and they, then they open up the seal and everybody starts eating and, and it's, it's a blast and, and these girls would have some of that food as well. So um, just, you know, the photos aren't nearly as nice as berries, but just to support um, and um, expand on some of the themes that Barry does, um, I chose to, to share these three photos with you guys love to have questions i i uh questions let me know what you guys want to hear about <laughs> but for now thema nakamik thank you thank you heidi that was beautiful those are beautiful photos and um what a way to become a mother thank you for sharing that story and it's fabulous that you are a mother to so many um and i think what i think maybe we'll keep going if people can put their um questions in the chat and we'll um, have time for them at the end um so yeah stephanie would you like to share something sure thank you uh so I'll just raise my hands to you both barry and heidi for their sharing and all of the beautiful work that they create uh for Urban Inuit and just so grateful to be included in this conversation. I was born in Yellowknife and uh, moved, actually my mom is from Australia and she wanted to move us to Australia when I was at age one, but they still had a all white policy in effect. So uh, we ended up making uh, Victoria our home for most of my life. And uh, so a lot of what I've learned is, is through family and through books and through amazing people like Alethea Arnick Brill from the Angry Inuk and the Duni retracing our, our ancestral lines of Inuit tattoos. 
And yeah, so I'm also a mom. My kids are, uh, I guess down here I was kind of young, but up north I was kind of old. My kids are uh, 22 and 20 years old. And uh, yeah, just a lot of what Heidi and Barry have shared really resonates with me in terms of like, oh, so similar. I feel like that's similar. Um, so we've been on similar journeys, although, you know, they each look unique, but they're very much similar in many ways. Uh, you know, I didn't plan or recognize myself as being an artist and then started being invited to to art shows and a lot of what I do is uh, making use of with what I have. Um, you know, just imagining that's what my ancestors would have done as well. And uh, yeah, and, and, and just being a, a urban Inuit hunter and gatherer, whether that's like through my dad, you know, he's really good at securing um, muktuk and caribou from the north or here, um, instead of being able to go and shoot the geese that are not too far away, uh, raising chickens, you know, so finding ways to be able to provide that sustenance for, for my family. Um, and yeah, so, so much of, of what both of you shared really resonated. And Heidi asked me if I would share some of the art that I do. So I put together uh, just a some pictures. I'm going to share my screen of some of the work that I do. I, I use lots of different mediums. So uh, my kind of earliest memories, I think I used art as a, a way to express my feelings, um, whether that was like giant, drawing angry pictures or something. And and then once I, and so drawing was a, a real outlet for me until I became a mom. And then I wanted to do something that was creative and functional. So I got into knitting, uh, spinning, uh, weaving and felting. And so these are a few of my weaves that I did last year with a bunch of hand spun. And I, I love projects that take a long time, things that you wouldn't be able to just quickly create. I, I love that kind of, uh, taking taking that time to to do things and again let's see if this is gonna go page down also offer an agreement i've been offering an agreement of patience with technology the past year and a half uh, so in my journey as uh being an urban inuit and uh First learning about our ancestral practices, I had an Indigenous youth who was working for the Ministry and Children and Family Development call and say, oh, we have a, a urban Inuit who's aging out in care and we'd like to find out what some of their ceremonies are for rites of passage. And so I called my, my great auntie up north, my Achung and the Dick and asked her and she's like, hmm, well, your, your grandma had face tattoos. And I was like, what? <laughs> uh, three weeks earlier my eldest had like tattooed themselves and I was like oh invisible tattoos you know you have to think about your career and then uh, six months later I was uh, uh, telling you know people I'm gonna go get my face tattooed by Mike Austin uh, out in London Ontario who is kind of one of the first folks that were helping that uh, the kind of resurgent, uh, resurgence of Indie tattoos. And so part of my journey is uh, always starting from within. So practicing on myself, doing whether that's stick and poke with the machine or on my knees, there are some skin stitching and uh, incorporating ceremony into that so that it just really making it, it feel like it's, it's a good thing, good thing to be doing. Uh, then I kind of expanded on doing stick and poke and uh, that's been a really having visible tattoos on my face that's been able to allow me to meet other urban Inuit they'll be like oh are you Inuk I'm like yeah and they are too so it's been a wonderful way to meet more urban Inuit as as well to be able to share some of those ancestral practices with each other to support each other and in, in reclaiming um these teachings and practices uh, that our ancestors had carried for many generations, thousands of generations. And then during the pandemic, uh, you know, pandemic 
because I think has come with some silver linings, like being able to all gather today from across Canada. Um, and also for me was silver linings was time to be able to practice machine tattooing. So that's something uh, during the last year and a half I've been uh, practicing and, and exploring being able to share with whether um, that's uh, other urban Inuit or friends and, and family and really honored this weekend going to be doing uh, the uh, tablong the chin for a, a urban young Inuk person uh, this this weekend. A few more, I just want to close up a more things. I, I love, you know, back to the fur, Heidi is talking about, I love working with fur and leather and repurposing uh, old fur coats that people now feel guilty about. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll take it. And so and here inspired from some patterns from uh, our Inuvalut calendar and this, and uh, where might I share the namesake, Bunny Revelook. And <clears throat> again, just, yeah, repurposing and here wanting to explore how to how to make waterproof things that are petroleum free and just looking for those ways to be continue to be uh, more sustainable. So I uh, did some wax coating of uh, a naturally dyed uh, repurposed linen tablecloth with khaki shibu, which is this persimmon fruit that you ferment for seven years and it becomes photoreactive. So it actually gets darker with the sun, which I think is pretty cool. And then a couple of things I also love to do is just uh, collaborating with people. This is something from June of this year, Nicole Neidhart, Navajo uh, artist and together, um, we did a mural community project. It was right around the time when we were going to be all coming in real life together again. And we came together with black and indigenous people and had ceremony and talked about how do we wanna be in relation to each other and centering indigenous people knowledge and practice, centering black and people of color. And then, and then what also emerged were the plant medicines and, and what a powerful way they can be in supporting us. And so invited community members, I think we had about 26 folks all suggest ancestral or plants that are important to them. And all in all, I think we had 97 folks involved in, in the mural creation, which was a lot of fun. And then one other recent collaborative project uh, was invited to be a part of Holding Ground, which is coming out of um, a time of how to, to hold space and to uh, care for and support Indigenous youth as they kind of take up that, that mantle of protecting the land and being land defenders. And so this was, uh, there was about 12 of us uh, artists and, and this curtain was created as initially to hold that space. And over the three months, uh, Indigenous youth and myself, we all contributed. So it's like a living art gallery where every week when you go, there would be more things. So yeah, and the last piece I just wanted to share is as another image that was really a gift from my cat during the pandemic. Uh, I live on the third floor and somehow it went up these steps and across the balcony and in through the cat door with a whole bunch of cedar and a heart and a wing and I sent it to my friend who does intuitive readings and and this is the image that she described to me. So I, I drew it into a piece of art and, and she said, you know, it's a, it's a dove and it's got these claws and these claws are holding this heart and it's the heart that gives us strength to blow the bugle, the call to peace and, and then the cedar providing protection as overall. So, so I just end on that as uh, I think, you know, all these times are so hard and it can be easy to, you know, hearing people about how they're behaving under stress and just that gentle reminder of, of uh, inviting in peacefulness, which is always only a, a belly breath away. Kayanik, thank you for the, listening and being able to share today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Beautiful work. Wow, all of you offer so much and it's um, that's really interesting and kind of heartwarming to hear about the communities that you're involved in and creating and supporting. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, there's time for 
for you to, you know, comment on each other's work for questions from the audience. Um, I have a few questions as well. Um, so, uh, ah, sorry, just kind of backing up here. There's so many comments. So, um, one of we one of the first questions was from our um, our one of our visitor engagement folks, um, Callie Jones, and she has a question for Barry. Um, she loves your art, it's very cool, good job. Any tips on how to take a good photo? And I had this question as well. The second question is, how do you know if a photo is art? I was curious too, Barry, about your transition from documentary to art photography. <laughs> By chance. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I seriously consciously took it, made a decision to try and create what? Uh, create uh photographic fine art right so in order to get recognized and to be to be uh taken seriously in the art world you have to create fine art and and uh to me it's just a matter of practice practicing 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 uh, i it really uh kelly it really depends on 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 what i'm looking at and what i'm trying to get out out of the image itself uh sometimes i'd make a conscious decision to to go take pictures of something very specific such as uh such as a drum dance or a throat singer uh so other times i just go out and take take an image that uh i i think uh may work out in the end uh based on uh my own experiences uh just going out and but also trying to develop concepts uh, ideas for my for future projects uh, what makes a good art uh, fine art i think quality uh i think it has to resonate with people i think my work resonates with a lot of people because it's at that at that community level at times uh whether it's a, a piece of meat or a piece of uh, country food or uh, a a comedic image i think it, it resonates with people especially the food people have saying oh look that i mean you made me hungry <laughs> right <laughs> looking at a piece of uh tuk -tuk or something oh you made me hungry <laughs> right but to me it's, it's it's about resonating it's about quality i think you have to have a uh, nice quality work uh, i think it has to be uh uh taken seriously and my i've all, my my objective has always been to be viewed whether it's a, whether it's a, a competition, whether it's a, a, a grant or, or looking to develop a, a project that, or just sending out a, a curatorial pr proposals. To me, it's, uh, I've, I've always been under the impression and the objective of being viewed first because if I don't be viewed, people will see my work, right? And, and then uh, if they see my work, they like it, then I will, uh, 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 comment on it and ap appreciate it more and and try and um, and uh, attain uh, those qualities uh, in all my artwork it has to be quality it has to be uh, I think uh, thought out at times and it has to resonate and it has to I think my work I've been focused on galleries because I when I'm trying to when I, when you try and develop a canon or a discipline within within a discipline itself you have to go to to the people who who can uh, critique, who can look at your work and suggest uh, things, suggest uh, ways of, of, of working or, 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 uh, or uh, uh, collaborating. Uh, but more importantly, it's to be viewed by galleries because galleries, people see your work. And it's also about being taken seriously as an artist uh, and and, and 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 developing your uh, practice uh, and being taken serious if that makes any sense to i, I don't know i always question what's fine art i always go, go, to me it's okay it's fine art it's a hanging in a gallery right it's in your gallery right now it's in the legacies gallery to me that's a, a coup it, it shows that i be taken serious uh, and that uh, it uh, it uh, 
resonates with people and people are interested in it and there's something to be said about it so so this is some of the things i i look at when i try and develop uh, fine art and trying to trying to move my practice ahead if you look at uh, the title uh Ungasitik, it's something that is far away i had never ever imagined i would have a show in victoria it's it's the furthest thing from my mind right so it's about exploration it's about migration it's about movement it's about uh challenging yourself and it's about uh connecting with people and to see if there's an interest to to move forward with a with a, a project or art itself, right? Thank you, Barry. We're so glad that you decided to do to send us something that is far away or send your work <laughs> far away to us. <laughs> yes, yes. Because if you look at the photography in, in as a as a genre as a medium within in Inuit art, it is far away too from the realms of Inuit art. What's what's being collected? What's being uh, 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 talked about what's being exhibited that sort of stuff so my my goal is always to try and help build a foundation for for photography within within the realm of Inuit art and you have to have certain I think uh, parameters such as value such as uh, uh, quality quantity and uh, assurance that you are doing uh, uh, things that are, are within the realms and within the possibilities of the genre itself Great, thank you. Uh, uh, there's a question for you, Stephanie, from Katrina. Um, do you stick and poke others? <laughs> and can you maybe talk a little bit more about your uh, tattoo practice? Sure, yeah, definitely. I, I do stick and poke other human beings and I have a, a little tattoo space to do machine tattooing as well. That's all set up. And uh, I can put in the chat my, I just started an Instagram account for doing uh, tattooing now that I've been practicing a bit more and definitely, uh, you know, echo what Barry was saying about the practice, practice, practice piece is so important. And for some of the tattoos, uh, you know, like the ones where I, I necess haven't necessarily been told what each of them means, some of them, you know, like the little stacks and those ones we would, in the pictures you see like, all these stacks of these little lines. And for me, those represent that practice to be able to practice to do those straight lines so that you know you can be brave enough one day to tattoo someone's face. <laughs> yeah, I'll put in my in the chat the Instagram account that, that you could reach out to connect with me on. And I'm taking December 15th to January 12th off. So I'll, I'm gonna have a bunch of time. <laughs> Great, thank you. So Letitia is asking a question. Uh, thanks, Letitia, for this question. What challenges did either or all of you did, did you come up um, of you have in coming to identify as Inuit? And what was most effective for you to connect and appreciate your heritage and roots while you were growing up in the South? Always a loaded question when it comes to identity, especially nowadays. Um, Growing up, I grew up in a time in Canada where there was a lot of shame a bit around being Indigenous, um, a lot of misinformation, a lot of um, don't talk about it, but, but it was very obvious, like <clears throat> my dad was proud to be Inuit, he, he would say he was proud to be Eskimo. Um, my mom is Dutch. My mom was born in the Netherlands and, uh, and moved to Canada in the late sixties. And my, my dad was born in Labrador before they joined Canada. Um, and they moved, they moved to Ottawa in the, in the late seventies, Barry mentioned earlier, it was, it was the late seventies. So my dad could work at the federal government and growing up, <laughs> like people would often ask me, like, are you Hawaiian? Are you Korean? Are you like, what are you? Right. And when I would tell them that I was Inuit and Dutch, they never asked about the windmills and the wooden shoes. They always asked about the igloos and the huskies, right? Like it was this, uh, this curiosity in, in folks that, that, um, you know, I didn't want to give misinformation. I didn't want to give wrong information. Um, and so 
I really had to learn, right? In, in order to answer, like, I don't know, I was just me, <laughs> right? Like, and one of the greatest lessons, like, I've had a hand in raising a lot of children, um, and they have taught me so much. And um, my my first son, the he taught me one time. We were we were in Nova Scotia. He was outside by me, and I was with him. He was seven years old, and and a neighbor said to him, "Are you half Indian or something?" And my seven year old, like he just kind of looked up at this stranger, this person, and he said, "I'm not half anything. I'm all Canadian," and it was just like good answer son <laughs> right like that's fantastic so i have never identified as being half like half dutch half inuit like that's i'm not half anything i'm all me um i do make it a point of saying urban inuk because i do want to respect those that have been born and raised in in the north um and what i i feel like when i say urban inuk then people understand that my experiences are slightly different than what, what they see when they see the North. Um, however, Inuit elders have said to me, like, don't say you're urban Inuk, you're, you're Inuk, you're Inuk, and you're Inuk, so you should just be proud of, you know, just say that you're Inuk. And and I I, I struggle with it because I've, I was taught to respect my elders, um, and I should um, identify, like, they tell me I should identify. Um, but I do feel like being an urban Inuk is, is its own thing. Um, we're, we're part of the land claim agreements, um, Nunatsiavut, Nunavik, Nunavut, and, and Nuvialuit. Um, but, but it's different because we are in the South. So it's a very long-winded, complicated answer for a complicated question. <laughs> Beautiful, Heidi. Thank you. Does any Stephanie or Barry like to weigh in on that one? Okay, uh, for me, it's very similar. I mean, growing up, I mean, like I said, I didn't grow up traditional. Uh, I moved out of my community, uh, small community when I was six or seven. Uh, my parents moved to Happy Valley Goose Bay, and they split up after after that. So, uh, uh, well, I always knew where, where we're from. Uh, the Inuit uh, identity growing up, I guess it was there, but it was also denial too. Uh, denial, not talking about it, uh, especially with the, uh, the, uh, the uh, circumstances around the residential schools in, 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 in Labrador uh, throughout the years, and especially uh, assimilation, col colonialization in Labrador. You have to, you have to remember uh, Labrador has been colonized for 270 years or whatever right so long uh, like that so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of lost culture there's a lot of pro lost practices uh throughout the years and trying to maintain and trying to connect with that has been, always been a challenge for me personally identity wise uh look at me, i look i don't look inuk for sure i've always been uh, look uh, i guess i live in a white man's world or settled settlers world so i live in that realm and trying to trying to maintain uh, connection to culture or practices is challenging, especially uh, even in Ottawa, for sure. Although Ottawa has a huge community, it is challenging at times, uh, times for sure. But to me, it's always always had an identity crisis growing up at to a certain extent uh, through denial and through uh, a lack of uh, cultural practice and that sort of stuff. But it, it was always there. It was always there. So you know, and 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 since living in Ottawa, I come to embrace my, my, my culture or lack of culture, because it is, it is a, it is a rec reclaiming my cultural practices uh, to a certain extent right now, especially the language, uh, for sure. But it's, it's maintaining that, and if you can main, maintain that uh, on an honest uh, 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 way for yourself and treat everybody with respect, and, and if somebody asks who, who you are, uh, let them know. I mean, I'm 56% Inuk, if you look at that, in good standing uh, under the Labrador Indian Land Claims Agreement, I'm a beneficiary. And if you look at the history of the, they did in terms of being a member of, of uh, Nunatsivut, uh, I'm 56% Inuk, so that's what I have. Uh, so uh, am I full Inuk? No, I don't consider myself like whatever that means. <laughs> it's just challenging at that. It's very complicated, as Heidi said, right? Uh, I, you know, it, at times you go, okay, uh, 
uh, uh, not fully nuke, whatever that means. Uh, but you know, uh, people do challenge you on it at times. Uh, and but to me, is is trying to be honest as as much as I can. Thanks so much for sharing. For myself, growing up, uh, I learned from going, being able to go up north a little bit. And uh, and then also I had a book set that was called Eskimos. <laughs> and uh, and growing up, I had, I had a friend's dad who was really fascinated with the north. And so he would always ask me questions about my culture. And, and so that was kind of you know, when I came into a young adulthood and finished my degree, moved up to the Northwest Territories uh, so that I could learn more about my culture and be connected to uh, my family and, and, and make those, uh, those connections. So, and yeah, identity has been a really interesting thing. Uh, definitely identify as being Enoch and also my Irish uh, background and I guess a little bit of Spanish. There was a shipwreck back in the day and I think it's important to honor all those lineages. And one of the things that I've found um, kind of really cool is like when I, I learned more about like Celtic um, practices and teachings, there's so much overlap with Inuit culture. And uh, so those are the pieces that really kind of give me hope. And, and, and I gain more and more like, uh, I don't know if pride is the right word, but just like strength definitely by uh, learning more about Inuit culture, you know, in terms of the way that we parented historically, uh, phenomenal and such aligned with the neuroscience, which is so cool, you know, like we didn't yell at our kids because then we taught them all we're doing is teach them to yell. And, and that's something I've, you know, had to reconcile as a mom because I uh, didn't know about uh, residential schools even though my dad went to one and my children's dad they actually went to the same school here you know here I thought I was being the best parent I could knowing what I knew to find out like oh I'm perpetuating some of those uh harmful residential school behaviors so you know those are things to just to have to reconcile in terms of like okay I I did that and I have to accept that and take responsibility and also not carry it like shame, because um, again, the neuroscience shows that doesn't help with behavior change. So yeah, it's definitely uh, been an interesting journey and definitely, um, you know, like watching the documentary on Inuit tattoos, I, I just had the whole, I think it's about 40 minutes long and the whole time I just had tears rolling down my face of like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't know I had these like so holes in my soul until now and and now it's like being filled back up and so that's been the really most powerful piece and being able to share those with my kids that gives me so much hope because they know all of this so much younger than me thank you thank you stephanie um yeah uh, thank you all just for sharing sharing the holes and how you fill them up and how you fill them up through cr your creative acts and all the other connection to people and connection to the land. Um, Cameron has a question that's related. Um, what is your go-to advice when someone comes to you about identity or re reconnection with your roots? I'm kind of thinking it means if someone's thinking about reconnecting to their roots. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Cameron. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Sorry. You mean <laughs> re reconnecting with your community or trying to find out your heritage? Is that what you meant? I'm not quite sure. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, to their own to their own roots, I think their heritage. I would say probably. That's a tough question. I need to think about that for a second. There's no, uh, there's no like how to booklet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you know, there's, if you know, how not to. Yeah, how not to. How yes. not to. <laughs> 
I mean, th I think, you know, if you want to reach out, to, uh, find out your heritage is, is reach out to, if you know your community or anybody from your community, even your family members, talk to them first to try and get a picture of, of where you're from and your heritage. Uh, I would I would start there. And if you have any community contacts or anybody within the community or even within a, a local organization back there, is, is to reach out to them and to find, explain your situation, explain your story and to see if you can actually find out ways that you could connect with your, your, your family or your community, right? That's the best I could offer at the moment. Read, read some, of course, read upon your, your, your heritage or your culture, read upon the community, read upon some of the cultural practices and protocols and that sort of stuff as well. Someone says the Vancouver Public Library offers a free program helping to use their archives to research one's ancestry. Um, there's, a, there's a question from Leticia about, um, as an Inuvialu parent who's partially raising my three kids in the South, any insight on how to prevent the identity crisis that Barry spoke of? Um, I know, so the difference between my childhood and then my oldest childhood and then my teenager's childhood and then my youngest childhood, um, partly it's society around them has changed a little bit, but. But I do find that my children and like my foster children um, that are rooted in their culture, who know their family history, who know like all sides, you know, like the Dutch and the Inuit and their dad's side, those ones seem to do better. Um, and I, you know, maybe it's a PhD thesis or something. I don't know. I, just observational. Um, the ones that know their family history to as much as possible, um, the ones that are connected to community, um, you know, that, that go to community events and, and, and feel connected to the community, they fare better. And how do you do that in, in a place that doesn't have a community is you, you find it um, and you find it any way you can. And, and, you know, we've got this wonderful thing called the internet, which um, has been amazing for that. That's my two cents worth. <laughs> yeah, I would echo. There's so many great resources online now, and and I think it's so important to do an assign when folks are are you know could benefit from from doing that exploration. Is cultural appropriation is basically an expression of that unmet need for those you know own ancestral lines and practices. So. Yeah, I think we're lucky to have the internet and be able to find so many resources. I know my my youngest has shared a lot of resources with me, and it's definitely um, the you know um, the reclaiming practices like tattooing and stuff has been a, a really big piece, and especially for the youth and and just like watching them transform. <laughs> pretty amazing, uh, empowering. So, uh, and then, yeah, I think I'm grateful that society is becoming more open accepting because that's a, a key piece, right? To be able to go outside and feel safe expressing yourself as, as you are and, and your lineage. Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, to, uh, <clears throat> I think be be yourself, be confident. Uh, I mentioned identity crisis. Uh, sometimes it's a, it's 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 a it's a fine line between confidence and identity crisis. So you know, uh, be confident in yourself. Uh, try and 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 learn as much as uh, you can about your your culture, your family, and 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 reach out to 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 not only the internet, of course, it's a great resource for sure, but try and seek out organizations in, in, in the uh, bigger community as well. I mean, there's a whole host of uh, Inuit organizations across Canada now, so with Southern Canada, so there's a, there's a, a whole uh, resource there as well, right? Who could, who could uh, help you, point you in the right direction and, and answer questions that you have, hopefully. And one thing I learned about confidence, where it comes from, is when you pause and your body, your breath, your mind, our spirit are all paused and in alignment. And that's where you can get a sense of confidence to come from, which, uh, yeah, something I stumbled upon because I didn't used to have a lot of confidence. <laughs> 
same here, especially when it comes to the language and trying to trying to learn your language, uh, trying to be, and having confidence to speak it and not mis make mistakes. Uh, I think I find that uh, challenging at times because I, you know, so I do make a lot of a lot of mistakes and and trying to keep those confidence up. It's it's challenge at times. Okay. Thank you very much, all three of you. I'm noticing the time, and I do know that Heidi needs to be three places soon. Um, that's what happens when you have lots of kids um, to care for. Um, but uh, yes, what a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all for sharing um, so deeply. What an honor and a privilege for all of us to be here and to witness your stories and your sharing. And I wish you all luck with your lives and your creative endeavors. And um, I hope that we'll see you soon. Yeah, and lots of thanking from the audience. Hey. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. Uh, thanks for your support and thanks for everybody for attending and participating. We really appreciate it.